very happy to host Klaus Segers today for a talk entitled Decoupling Europe and Russia After an Unanticipated War. I'm Elise Giuliano, um, political science senior lecturer and director of the master's program at Harriman Institute. And um, as I said, you know, this is, uh, I, I would like to say a series, but our series seems to be a bit interrupted after all the COVID and the, the confusion of the last um, year or two. So we're really, really pleased that uh, Klaus could be here in, in person. Um, um, we have hosted him here as a visiting professor in years past. Um, so it's a, a welcome back. Um, so let me just, um, the format for today, I'll, I'll just uh, uh, read you his bio and then he will give a talk and then we'll have a question and answer period. Um, so if you could just hold your questions to the end, but when you do ask a question, please introduce yourself. Okay, so Klaus Segler studied history, political science, philosophy, and Slavic languages in, and please forgive my Russian, Bochum, Constance Bremen from 1974 until 1980. He earned a PhD in Bremen. He was a research fellow at Frankfurt University. And after that, he worked for Germany's biggest think tank, the SWP in English in the 90s, where he was the head of the Department for Eastern Europe. In 1996, he became professor of international and East European politics at Freie Universite in Berlin, where he also established the Center for Global Politics. Come on in. Segwer's also taught at SIPA. Here, you can come in and sit at SIPA, the School of International Affairs at Columbia, and as I mentioned, at Harriman Institute, as an affiliated professor, the last time in 2019. Seems like it was more recently than 2019 that you were here. No? Uh, um, I think it wasn't in the winter 1920. Oh, okay. So it was 2020. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And which was wonderful. Um, <laughs> and um, okay. So I'm not going to spend waste time summarizing the talk. I will mm -hmm. let. Him just present it to you, and uh, you are in for an intellectually stimulating treat. Wow. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. It's very good to. It's very good to be back to uh, press. Uh, I cannot say it's getting easier for North America. Even uh, when you come from Europe, uh, my experience is it's getting kind of cumbersome to put it in a friendly way. Then not this time, but the previous time when I was a uh, J1 engineering run, it was yeah. under yeah. yeah. But I made it finally. So what I want to do with you is to talk about uh, some issues related to the war and the consequences of the war, which maybe are not so intensively or frequently discussed as uh, other things. And I'm very interested to learn what your position is on that. I will briefly talk about the explanation for the war, or I should say explanations for the war. Briefly about the crisis and what's going to happen or not to happen in this uh, winter. I'll talk about um, certain issues which are across to other issues. For example, what are the structures of the most relevant narratives talking about this uh, this war? A couple of uh, remarks on the role of the European Union and then on what I call the public and what I think will be indeed the future. Okay, explanation of the wars are plenty So first of all, we don't know because no one know what the real reasons were of those people who finally after three quarters of the year of preparation where we Every day we're exposed to lies. No, we're not going to one day. That is uh, related to military exercise. And that was for nine months before it happened. <clears throat> I think one one issue which is probably fair to assume plays that is the place of 
is that the ruling group in Russia, which is not the government, it's the president for a couple of years, this way, would not like to see another post-Soviet, especially Slavic country, make a successful modernization or, in, or development, because that could lead to questions in Russia itself, right? right? I think that is uh, one important thing. <laughs> then another one we have in the last one and a half to two years, a remarkable ethnic nationalistic hybrids in the show. When you read some uh, materials, some, some texts, some articles, you frequently find that uh, Ukrainians and Russians are basically the same. And from these photos, logically, there is no need for a separate Ukrainian group, which identifies itself different from Russia. Or even less so is there any kind of right on a sovereign state of independence and autonomy. Five or ten years ago, but in the last couple of years, increasingly we find that sometimes these articles are were published with the signature of the president himself. So it's uh, on the side he goes into history. Another thing which is very important when you look at the previous military adventures of Russia in 2008, Georgia 2014, Crimea 2015. Donbass that was all following certain changes in the popularity data of the president. And immediately after the military acted, data changed back to the previous times, right? That is also something because it works. So why not give it another try? Russian president, like the Chinese president, were very carefully observing how the West, the West, reacting on previous military uh, conflicts. There were sanctions, um, but not more. So the Russian president could assume if he tries it again, now not with Crimea or Donbass, but the rest of Ukraine. Chances are that um, the Western reaction may be muted. Also, it was not long ago that the West had a very messy, messy retreat from Afghanistan. You all remember these scenes from the airport, right? So they also undermined the image of a weaker and weaker West who may not be able to follow on with any kind of serious action. So all that was the background of, uh, of what happened. Um, Could you speak up a bit for, for the virtual audience? The guest says he can't hear so well. Oh, OK. But in that direction, or is it? <laughs> well, I don't know. Let me ask. <laughs> I, I really don't know this. this do you know? This Can we put it? I don't know. I don't, I don't think it's that. Okay, I get my best. I don't think it's that, yeah. Yes. And um, one final remark for this kind of thing about the uh, explanations. There is a very interesting debate going on in international relations literature regarding this um, war. And actually, not only there, but also in mainstream uh, newspapers. For example, the most important representative of a scientific direction, which is called neorealism, John Mersheimer, mm -hmm. had a couple of very influential articles in the Southern Affairs, where he said, uh, number one, why are you so upset? <laughs> Russia is a great power. If you look back in history, great powers did what they wanted to do. So why are you surprised, right? Number two, it's not our issue. 
Who cares about Ukraine? Our issue is China. China is the big challenge in the future. And instead of wasting our capabilities and ammunition and whatever money, resources, nerves, for the tiny place like Ukraine, oh, maybe, maybe many people would have had problems to identify it on the map. No, China is the thing of tomorrow. And had quite a lot of people who found it plausible. It is parsimonious as an explanation, right? It is simple. It is, you know. uh, I have sympathy for the guy because he's a very nice guy as a, as a person. But as often in science, and especially in social science, I always told my students it's not about it's not about true science, it's about plausibility. And at the end of the day, you have to make your own decision about normative things. There's no right or wrong when it comes to normativity, right? And realists have the general opinion it is all about states. There is no arbiter when there is an issue between a debate between states. It is between states, and that is why each state state has to prepare itself for the worst, always for the worst, like armament and whatever. So that is a normative assumption. If you, you can share it or not. You also can share the, the other assumption, which I uh, talked about before, that the domestic side is very important when it comes to the external behavior of governments and states, right? Uh, realists say, no, we don't care about the domestic landscape at all, right? Uh, but there are many people who do. And I belong to those who think, um, while this Mershammer thing is very convincing and parsimonious, very elegant maybe, right? It may not be the right one, or there are other ones which are at least also quite plausible. So that is what I wanted you to, to know, that we have this kind of debate in the background. There are different phases of the war, as you all know, like the Russians went in expecting that in a couple of days, or at least a couple of weeks, Kiev would fall, and Kharkiv also, and the whole country as well. That, as we know, did not materialize. Uh, there are different reasons. First of all, the Russian army was in a much worse condition, as most people were expecting it was. Motivation, no delegation in the army. The Ukrainians have a lot of delegation in their armed forces. Um, Increasingly, from week to week, the Ukrainians were becoming better and better in defending themselves. Not only they, but also with help from Western countries, which played a crucial role, obviously, right? But this expectation is a matter of uh, it's a matter of a couple of days or weeks. That oh, I thought there is water to pour in here. Oh, that's, that's the microphone. <laughs> that's the microphone. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, guys, out there online. Uh, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> yes. Uh, and the Russians were very dependent and still are on artillery, quite often quite old artillery, and they do not have to seem too much ammunition of that. Um, then in summer, the Ukrainians managed to, to regain a significant mass of their own ter territory, what the Russians occupied in the preceding months, that gave them a different mentality, right? They are not necessarily in the role of the loser. They can move something. And that was also important for, for the negotiations with Western sponsors and donors, because the sponsors and donors learned, oh, money may be well invested, they can actually use it in a proper way. So that was uh, relevant. And in the recent weeks, we have two uh, events and trends to observe, which may be relevant for the issue if now nothing will much happen, because there will be winter time. And as the Germans learned and Napoleon learned in the past, during the winter, it's better not to go to war in these areas of the world. But 
uh, the donors, some of them, of the Ukrainians, started domestic debates about uh, when is it enough to help, especially here in this country. And the Ukrainians and the Europeans were very nervous before the midterm elections because uh, a double switch, both of the Senate and the House to Republicans would definitely have meant that the support for Ukraine would be more difficult, let me put it carefully, right? So that did not materialize. But we also have a completely unexpected development in Russia proper. So what we remember and what we expected was that the remaining liberal rule-based intellectuals, intellectuals, other people in Russia don't like this war at all and would maybe do protests and they did that. Now there is not much left. Hundreds of thousands of these people left the country. Um, Tens of thousands are in prison. Some of them are dead. So there is simply not the substance of more demonstrations. And I think you can, we can all understand that. But there is anyways a protest. And this protest is pretty sharp, pretty outspoken, but it's not from the liberals, it's from the other camp. It's from the patriots in Russia. And all of the most well-known <clears throat> patriots by now don't have any kind of uh, problem with openly, with their name, criticizing the way how the Russians go to war, and also explicitly the president, especially since the very much botched decision to mobilize, to some extent, people, because this uh, instruction to mobilize made sure that the war, who was not a war until then, but a special little operation, right? But with the decision to mobilize, the war was carried in the last family in far Siberia, because everyone was now worried. What about my husband? What about my brother? What about my son? And so, right? Will they also be sent to, to this war? So that was Apparently not a good decision or not executed or implemented. <clears throat> but the patriots are really crucial because when the president would lose a significant number of these political circles, then he has serious reason to worry for himself, right? And both things, when the Ukrainians would say, okay, we gained, we regained a lot of land and we can now sit out the winter or when the Russian army said okay we will do that both had to face significant political groups who would criticize that and would not like that so that is something we should uh, so <clears throat> then these uh, uh, issues across other topics one thing is about the structure of discourses in both countries. This is one war where you don't find much about the economy from both sides. You don't find much about politics from both sides. But from both sides, you find a lot about ethnical and cultural issues, very much so. And that is interesting for different reasons. Uh, one reason being that when you have issues, family and your company or between states, where the issue is economic issues or political issues, it is not so terribly difficult necessarily to find a compromise. When it is about identity things, ethnic things, you rarely are ready to make compromises on these cultural and ethnic things. That is much more difficult to compromise here. But this is the very core of the conflict we are talking about. Here. 
<clears throat> Another thing, which is quite relevant, maybe a little bit too much in Western countries, is the issue of escalation, right? So when one side has the impression that with conventional forces, they cannot move like they would like to move or gain what they want to gain, right? You can consider escalation. We have horizontal escalation, which means to bring in other countries, neighboring countries. And that is exactly what the Poles and the Bolts are worried about, right? Or you can make a vertical escalation. That means you move away from conventional weapons and apply other weapons of mass destruction, for example, not only nuclear ones. So <clears throat> I don't expect that uh, short term because I guess everybody is, is uh, knows what is involved here in both cases. Other countries mean, means NATO will be involved immediately, right? And uh, weapons of mass destruction means that other countries also could then use weapons of mass destruction. But <clears throat> when one side, especially the Russian side, would feel that its own survival is under question. Personally, I've got my personal experience and my readings and my contacts. I do not really doubt that they will do that. I know that's not a good message pre-Christmas, but we talk about that, right? So when you would ask me, I would say, well, when it is about survival, they will do that. As I said before the war, six months and more, they will go to war. So, but let's hope that it does not come, come to be. Okay, another thing which is often hotly debated is the role of sanctions. Many people say, why do we do the sanctions and look at Russia, right? They have no less money as before, because yes, there's, most of the oil is not reaching Europe anymore, West Western Europe anymore. Mm -hmm. So there should be much less money, but at the same time, because there is scarcity, with energy, the prices for oil exploded all over the world, right? And the Russians don't have much problem to find customers, different customers, especially China and India and other countries. And the advantage of oil over gas is that you can easily ship oil, but not gas. For gas, you need tubes, pipes, right? For oil, you don't need that. You can ship it and, and send it in different ways. So probably as the end result of this year, the Russians did not have less income from exporting energy than last year. So you could say sanctions failed. I would say careful, wait a moment. It is not a good idea to expect that sanctions have the effects you want them to have after two and a half months. That's not gonna happen. It takes more time, right? So we have to wait for next year and forecasts from OECD and World Bank and others are that the next year, given that the sanctions stay in place, will have significant more effects in Russia. Another thing is that from an academic position, there are different uh, roles for sanctions. And that is also very important to know. Basically, I think there are three different roles. Role number one, which most people think is the basic task of, of sanctions, is to make a government to return to the status quo ante. That is a government does something, right, does something wrong, and then there are sanctions, and those who decided sanctions want the other government to return to the status before the sanctions were implemented. For example, uh, there are many other, other examples. There's a whole literature on sanctions. You know that South Africa and apartheid and others, right? So there's many very different examples of, of sanctions. But to 
uh, reinstitute the status quo ante is not the only role of sanctions. The second important role is that someone has violated against important rules of international relations. And then these rules have to be, that is the technical term, to be enforced. So that side which has violated something has to be punished. So that is the punish role of sanctions, number two. And the third role is also very interesting. A sanction also can be used to signal other potential violators in the future, perpetrators in the future, not to do that. Because when they do it, they see here what may happen, right? So there are three different tasks or roles for sanctions. It's not only immediately to restore the status quo ante. Okay. The next uh, point I will make is how all that works uh, for the European Union. Mm -hmm. um, two things were maybe to some extent surprises. First, hardly anybody would have expected that the EU would be so united in its reaction to the Russian aggression, because many people say EU, oh, that is a, well, chaotic kind of group, and they rarely get anything done. But here, united, they decided and decided again and extended again over and over every six months, six months, the sanctions. Not everyone was happy with them, but they were decided about unanimously, because if not unanimously, we don't get anything done yet, which is a big, big problem. But so far, uh, the EU was united, okay, in brackets, I should say, yes, there's Hungary, right? And Hungary causes headaches, but still so far, they are still on board when it came to extending these sanctions. In addition, even candidate status was granted to Ukraine, being in war. So everyone who sees TV knows that such a country in this kind of situation cannot become a member tomorrow or next month. That is clear. But it is mostly a symbolic act, uh, also to shorten the waiting period of time for the period after the war that they don't have to go all this cumbersome way to, and then wait another 10 years or whatever. So, so I've, I've found that a good decision to give them this uh, candidate status, given how the things are. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, we have to be frank and open with ourselves. The EU, still a club with very, very many members, right? Some people forgot how many that are. There were one more until recently, and now it is one less because the UK left. Our, this is a small group here, so I can be very frank. And let me tell you, there are member states inside the EU who, if they would not be members now, would never have a chance to become a member. That is how it is. And we are much better to have very sophisticated rules how to become a member. You have to work through 30 plus chapters of political, economic, cultural, whatever things. And you have to make that your legislation is completely in sync with all these 30 something chapters, right? You have to fulfill the Copenhagen criteria that you are a democracy, that you have the rule of law, that you have market regulated economy, that you have minority protection and intent. So huge mountains of paper, what you have to do when you want to become a member. Once you are in, there's almost nothing how to get rid of you. <laughs> and that is the secret why Hungary and Poland can do what they are doing right now. So, and there are two things which I think I can say uh, have been learned also during the war. The time of adding members over and over and 
over again has to be over. That is not working any longer. For administrative, technical reasons, financial reasons. I mean, every of these 28 now, right? Minus yeah. seven. All oh, right, they are gone, right? <laughs> yes. So every member country of these 27 members is entitled to have a commissar, a minister in Brussels, right? How many government members do we need, right? And we have unanimous decisions in many cases. Now, imagine you need one country which says no to something. The whole thing runs against the wall. So these two things, we have to change. Um, though it is not easy. The membership is the biggest asset the EU has to placate other countries, right? It's not like to make them members, but the expectation that you can become a member had huge, huge positive influences. For example, in the early uh, 2000s, when it was about the Baltic countries, and they had some issues with minorities and language issues and whatever. But the perspective to become an EU member made them to compromise in these other fields, right? So that is a big, big, big thing to help countries in a way to do things they otherwise would not have liked to do. That is mostly a positive effect. So, you can hardly have negotiations with the six countries, for example, in the Western Balkan, Bosnia Herzegovina, North Macedonia, Montenegro, Kosovo, Albania, whatever. Oh, Serbia. Oh, my God. Yeah. So, you can make that one or two years. You can tell them you have to make a compromise here about your language and even your name in the case of North Macedonia. And they do that. And then you say, oh, maybe not right now. So there are problems. And particularly with the Western Balkans, that is also an area where Russia and China are very, very much interested in this area, right? So when we tell them, okay, you do this and that, and then we can elevate you to candidate and then membership. And then you do this and that, and there is, oh, maybe not now, that is not a good answer. <laughs> so there is a problem. But we have to rethink it fundamentally. And the French President Macron, a couple of months ago, he had a speech, he has many speech, but he had one speech <laughs> where he suggested to create a new political body, a political European community which obviously has a different name than European Union. So obviously it is a different organization then. And his idea was then we have some, some organization where we can bring in those countries who maybe were in the EU, but didn't want any more, like UK. That is not membership. It is a different organization, but it is close, right? Other countries with whom we are negotiating for 180 years, not quite, yeah. but like Turkey, right? Where everyone knows, never ever, right? Yeah. Will they move forward to membership status? And the Turks have a point when they say, well, what, what, do we, what should we think about your behavior here? civilized EU, that is not good. Mm -hmm. But at least after the coup attempt a couple of years ago, right? And then the ever more hardening situation of the legal sectors in Turkey and the media sector and whatever, right? It is not likely that that ever can work. So that also could be a candidate for this, right? Political community, Europe, European community, <clears throat> or maybe parts of the Western Balkan or or Georgia, I think that for Ukraine and Moldova, they are still on the track to full membership, different reasons, but uh, 
Armenia, Georgia, not to talk about Azerbaijan is a different case. It also could be a group which could be brought into this, right? So I think we have to think in, um, in this direction because we cannot have more and more and more members. And this is closely related to the second issue, which we also have to, to modify, and that is the uh, procedures for decision-making. I mentioned it already before. Not for everything, but for very, very many political issues, economic issues, you do need unity or an animus voting. That is, if you talk to people who spend a quarter of their life in the nights in Brussels, negotiating because here or there, countries where the names of the countries are not well known to everybody, say no, 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 I don't want that to do. And the rest of them has to spend the night there in the room in Brussels, and it goes on and on until you have figured out what is the price for this country to give in, right? Mostly we call that very elegant side payments, side payments. You have to get a side payment that you do something which you maybe are not happy to do, but on the other hand, you get the side payment. So maybe you can compromise them on the other thing as well. So <clears throat> the easy solution would obviously a uh, majority decision-making. Everyone knows that, but um, everyone calculates at the same moment, oh, what have I and what uh, bad things are waiting for me when I accept that. So also the Germans, who are officially one of the biggest proponents of majority rule, right? But recently they took a isolated decision to partner up not with France, but with another consortium for anti-ballistic missile development things, right? And the friends were like, hey, aren't we in a union? Aren't we friends, best friends? Why didn't you, why don't you talk with us? And uh, the way how the German Bundeskanzler, Chancellor, uh, this early summer was traveling through the world and buying energy, whatever looks like energy, right? And he paid any price, no matter what, elevating thereby the price level for everybody else. Right? Was that solidarity? No, it was not. So that's not something for other countries. Also, Germany has to think about that. Uh, that that may have consequences when we when we go that uh, that way. And finally, uh, minutes <clears throat> is decoupling the whole mess with too close relations, economic mostly, but also cultural with Russia and China. The real theoretical background of that is called modernization theory, which basically assumes that all societies and all countries more or less have the same way of development. When you have a certain development and dynamism and your social economic development. It was many years ago, the criteria was like $10,000 per year per capita. <clears throat> then you are kind of at a, at a place where you can talk about, uh, you have a middle class and uh, the middle class has interests, not only economic interests, but also political interests. So they want participation in their country, right? And once you have this middle class, democracy sooner or later will knock at the door. That was the case in the US and Western Europe and in parts of East Asia, South Korea, Japan, but not everywhere, especially not in China and not in Russia. In both countries, we have vast middle classes by now. Unbelievable, lots of money. They travel to all kinds of countries. They buy cars I couldn't afford in Germany, right? But they can it. Electrical cars, <laughs> self-produced, self whatever. 
So something is wrong with the theory here. Or you can argue, well, give them more time, but I'm not sure. I think it's time enough. <laughs> Um, and the consequence for this modernization theory was a very famous formula coined by especially German governments, Wandel durch Handel, change through trading. So let's do trade with them, like importing energy and whatever, or let them interact with us, like buying our cars, Volkswagen in Germany is to 41% dependent on car sales in China. Almost half of the turnover. BMW, BMW, 30%. Other big companies, similar. That is not much less dependency as Germany had from Russia in terms of gas and oil. Because we thought it is a good, relatively cheap way for us to import energy and to sell cars, right? Plus, we contribute to the development and the maybe even democratization of the other country. But when this does not work, there is no reason to continue with that because the dependency would still be around. And we now know how that feels. All summer, Germany, every time, every, every day, how much how much gas do we already have for the winter, right? The reservoirs, are they full to 70%? Oh, 73 already, 75, weather is kind of. So the whole year we spent in this way, how can we survive the winter? Because we were so stupid for decades, decades, successive governments in Germany, except our dependency from uh, Russian oil and Russian gas. So we never should do that again. And not only we, but also other countries shouldn't do that again, because it doesn't feel good. So therefore, I think this war mostly, of course, has negative sides, but there is one positive aspect, which is that the coupling is in full course. It's running already. More than 1,000, 1,000 companies from Germany left Russia for good in the last six months. Some even didn't sell their assets in, in Russia because the, Russia, the Russian government said, ah, why do you want money? You can stay. Huh? When you don't want to stay, no money. Are just... So it is, in full, it is in full process, this kind of uh, decoupling on other, from other countries as well. And when you don't can sell your assets, you don't come half a year later and say, oh, I want to come back, right, and do the investment again. So therefore, the um, starting conditions looking from now on are much better than they have been before. And the same goes for our culture. I, Elise mentioned I had my own center for global politics for 15 years, and I made um, programs for international students, master students all over the world, in Cambodia, Vietnam, Myanmar, China, Iran, uh, first Syria, then later Jordan, Russia, Turkey, and so on. And I'm glad that I did that. And for the most of the time, I think it was worth the effort. But just to give you one example, the last two years in China were very, very bitter. And you are a foreign um, instructor or professor teaching a course for Chinese students. You can be sure that you only can get rooms with audio and video equipment where everything everything what a student says in a discussion or whatever will be recorded. And who am I in the first session to tell the students, oh, please speak up your mind. It's an open discussion <laughs> atmosphere. Well, the Chinese colleagues I invited to participate in my, in my program and they did that were harassed. Like they couldn't go for 
travels to other universities in other countries. They had to bring uh, their concept for certain seminars they want to do to the dean, and the dean has to approve that. And so, and worse, legal harassment and whatever. And also, you put the student at risk, of course, right? So once you uh, understand that, you have to give up. They don't even formally to, to say, stay home. We don't want you. They just, they just have to do this. And you understand you cannot stay home, right? So China is gone. Hong Kong is gone. Uh, Myanmar is gone, obviously, right? Russia is gone. There formerly, my partner was closed. The Faculty for Political Science at Gimo, which educates all Russian diplomats. They closed the whole faculty for political science, so I didn't have a partner anymore. And formerly, the reason was, oh, after all, political science is a very Western science. I said, well, if you think your diplomats don't need that, good luck with that, right? So all that is gone. So therefore, talking about city twinning and academic contacts and why don't we go on when it is possible, I don't believe in that, right? So. That is why I think decoupling is probably a thing we should do to protect ourselves and also because the positive outcomes which were there for a while are not there anymore. Uh, obviously, we cannot decouple from certain things. We will have to talk in the future also with China and Russia when it comes to regulating natural catastrophes or the impact of weapons of mass destruction. So for these kind of things, we have to talk. <clears throat> but I don't think for many other things, for other issues. Thank you very much. Now I'm happy to get your comments and questions. Okay, thank you, Bert. Really wise ranging set of comments. Um, I want um, everyone to think of their questions and maybe I'll just begin with uh, uh, if you could say a little bit more in detail about um, the German business community, because, you know, before the war started, the most recent war, not the war in Donbass, and we heard different things about, you know, really the, the German business community not being willing to go along. And as you, as you explained, um, with, with, um, with the sanctions or with a tougher response to Russia. So um, as you explained, that hasn't been the case. So I wonder if you could talk about, you know, oh, were these kind of representations of the business ties between Germany and Russia overstated? Was the business kind of um, alliance with political party in, in Germany overstated? Or has it changed? Has it shifted as a result of the war? Um, just because it's so critical to the sanctions regime and really to the unity of Europe um, for Germany to remain the, the kind of key pillar of the anti-Russian uh, you know, pro-Ukraine um, group of states. So if you could just talk a little bit about what the process looked like within Germany, I think it would be a little bit interesting. I think uh, two, two changes. One is that the German business is, and business associations, mm -hmm. which were the strongest advocates mm -hmm. of very, very cozy relationships between Germany and Russia or Germany and China. Mm -hmm. And way up to 2014 and 50, they could say, okay, Donbass, that is something sad. And so, but there will be a good ending for that, right? Mm -hmm. There was the Minsk process and the Normandy formers, so in French and Germany and Ukrainians and Russians uh, met frequently to talk about it. And it was not to be excluded that sooner or later there could be an agreement, right? right. And not as many died as now, and we didn't have as much TV footage as now. Right. Absolutely. And so most of them said, okay, that is a little bit, little dip, but sooner or later we can continue. Mm -hmm. And everyone needs energy, and that is cheap energy. And sooner or later, everything will be fine again. So, with this war, which every evening we all can follow on TV, including, including serious human rights violations, right? Or you can look at it at the, on the internet when you want. Maybe you shouldn't, but 
yeah. horrific things yeah. you can see there, or just reports from women repeatedly raped or kids massacred and whatever. That is a different level of uh, impact, right. media impact than before. Mm -hmm. And the second change is that all the other governments, they previously were working in sync with these business associations, but now Germany has a different government mm -hmm. to some extent, mm -hmm. social democrats again, <laughs> But uh, the Greens are represented mm -hmm. and the Free Democrats, and that makes a big difference. Those people who are in the government are very tough when it comes to Russia and China. Mm -hmm. And they also see it pays because they are also the most popular members of the government, despite mm -hmm. the fact or because they are tough, whatever it is, right? So that are significant changes. And then the, government, the business and business associations understood they either have to change or to go away. Mm -hmm. And then they said, okay, politic is leading and we have to follow. Mm -hmm. okay. But in the Eastern parts of Germany, former GDR, when you travel there, you find still a significant number of people who say, well, the Russians were so nice to us <laughs> for so long time, and we have good economic relations, mm -hmm. and we are waiting for the time when we can continue where we have to break up. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying these people mm -hmm. are disappearing, right? But now the the... Our relations are different, and the media situation is different. Mm -hmm. So do you, just to follow up, because I think this is important, I mean, I feel like Putin is still waiting. He's still trying to wait out Europe and trying to, you know, trying to undercut the those, that common opinion forged by the media um, images of all of the dead Ukrainians, etc. cetera. Um, so it's interesting that you brought up the GDR, but you, what what kind of you know chances would you give to Putin's kind of hope? Or uh, uh, I mean, you already discussed oil and gas; that's not working out so well for him. But just this kind of eventual splintering of of Germany um, from among the anti-Russian position. Yes, not only Germany, right? It was imagined that Macron wouldn't have won the presidential yeah. elections, yeah. Right? right? Or imagine that the new Italian prime minister who seems to be in some questions quite principled mm -hmm. would have stick with her previous positions to leave the Euro or the EU, right? Mm -hmm. Or there are many other things Ma yeah. I mentioned. Uh, I mentioned Hungary already. So, the question of European unity is crucial, of mm -hmm. course. I mean, there would be serious cracks, or not only cracks, but um, serious um, people who would withheld their okay for an extension of Russia's sanctions, right? Or these kind of things. That would be that would be very bad, and. Um, Frankly, when you look around the domestic politics of uh, European governments, they are not so selfish world, right? And especially in Germany and France, we have a record of <clears throat> since the war began, uh, to, throw, to throw money at the people for sometimes purposes where you don't quite understand what, what why has everybody who fills his car tank with gas to get 50 euro? I mean, there are certain people who need it, but I do not really need that, frankly, and other people either, right? So that is not, not, target, not targeted money showering mm -hmm. strategies. Okay. Oh, let the people just, not think we forgot about, about them, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, we have the Ukrainians, but we also have our own people. Mm -hmm. Because uh, there are sometimes demonstrations in the east of Germany and, and other countries. Uh, 
we longer, how long are we still expected to help the Ukrainians, right? Enough is enough. We also need money. We also need kind of social support or whatever. So we have these kind of things. It is not dominant yet, right? But when the winter would be terrible, cold, <laughs> you can imagine that there could be side effects from that also to the political. So I'm not saying it is one, we won that, but we have to be careful and to, to observe it. Mm -hmm. There certainly are political camps in all European countries where the extreme right and the extreme left both say, let's be nice again to Putin. Mm -hmm. There are reasons for that, but that's not the question. Mm -hmm. you. I'm Johnny Braden, I teach here at Columbia. Uh, let me, uh, I have lots of questions, but I'll narrow it. Oh. <laughs> okay. One is uh, decoupling. But let me start with Chancellor Cole. In 1994 or 95, don't remember the exact year, he said, and I'm not sure that anyone asked him, Russia will never be in the EU. But Russia is not going away. There's no way it's going away, nor is China going away. Uh, then we have Moshe Dayan from Israel fame uh, saying that you don't make peace by talking to your friends, you make peace by talking to your enemies. Is decoupling the same as isolation? And if you have isolation, I talk to myself, and you know what the hell comes up when I talk to myself. A lot of ridiculous and strange and maybe even terrible ideas. So what I'm saying is, is decoupling really the answer or is it just the lack of a better policy at this time? I think when you have uh, countries and governments which are notoriously not ready to accept international rules, not only armaments, not only starting a war. But in the case of Russia, there is hardly one type of sports where you cannot find state-sponsored doping. They just notoriously don't accept rules, right? And now this war. So at a certain point, and bundle durch handel, change through trading, didn't work either. You have not many, a few options, right? And all of them were discussed in the last 30 years or whatever. One is to promote or to mm -hmm. support regime change. I'm against that. I say, yes, we have ter terrible governments, especially in Russia. I mean, they poison people when they don't like them, right? What can I tell you? So, but even then, to change the regime is the task of the people living there, not of people living in other countries. You can come to different answers, but that is my answer to that question, right? So I'm not in favor of supporting external regime change. Maybe sooner or later, the people also, with a successful Ukraine next door, right? And the Russia people say, oh, I mean, they are not stupid. Hundreds of thousands of people, well-educated, middle-class, very much educated. They are gone, they leave. There must be a reason for that. So I think they have to do it themselves. But before they do it, and when they are so far away from rules, we should, Hatch ourselves against future experiences of this type. As I said, for very important things like natural catastrophes or weapons of mass destruction, you need channels of communication, obviously. But for other things, I wouldn't know why. Yeah. Um, I'm... Questions. Question number one. Uh, do, you, do you think Putin misunderstood American political division? Um, you know, January 6, then uh, or did he think that it was some kind of weakness? And we haven't talked a lot about NATO. 
uh, what do you think will be the future of NATO, especially in 2024, if Trump wins? And he was, again, so, so in, in uh, hunting Russia. I think I'm, I'm not sure what he thinks in general, right? Also, not regarding January 6th. Um, I'm not sure that many Americans are so clear what they should think about that as well. Um, it was this the tipping point beyond which you had a blossoming literature books and, and newspapers, some of them very good books, where there was a question like how to prevent civil war in America. Mm -hmm. How to prevent uh, armed conflicts on the streets, not between drug cartels, but between different groups of different political leanings or whatever. And uh, yeah, so I'm not sure about his assumption. There, there is a, another dim dimension, as we all know, right? The relationship between Trump and, and Putin, and most of us are not so clear, not so clear about what that, what that is at the end of the day. But. Um, <clears throat> Coming from Europe, I can tell you that the prospect of another presidency of this person is, is a nightmare. <clears throat> um, for good reasons and for bad reasons. The good reason, I mean, to have the, night, to have the nightmare. It's the right thing to have the nightmare because we know from his first presidency what his assumption is about NATO. He thinks that there are member countries who admittedly, unfortunately, don't pay enough for their own defense. He thinks they owe this money America, right? Mm -hmm. This money is supposed to serve NATO, not, not America. Like he sends a check to them and they didn't pay the check or something. And also obsolete and whatever, all these kind of things, right? That is um, that was very that was very unexpected, and uh, I'm not quite sure if it was a wake up call or not, because ever since we have two related developments. One is that we have much more talking and also serious talking about a European autonomy in terms of defense policy. We have it more intensely this debate than before. To talk about it does not yet to finance it, right? Mm -hmm. But coming from Germany, you may vaguely remember those people like in my age around the, ta the table that in late February this year, Germany had a speech of the German Chancellor in the Bundestag, and he said, we will have a hundred billion euro for bringing the Bundeswehr in a situation that it is more feasible to take it seriously. That was unbelievable until then, right? Also guaranteed for the future, the 2% from GNP contribution to NATO. I mm. uh, never heard about before such a thing, right? And it looks like he was serious. So that is not only talking, there is some serious uh, move, movement going on. And other countries the same, by far even better than Germany, Poland and the Baltic countries and French and uh, UK is not uh, EU, but still NATO. So because of the nuclear weapons, so that's expensive. Right. So I think this uh, has to continue because we don't know not only about Trump, we also don't know how 
reasonable and not Trumpist, the new star of the Republicans DeSantis really is, right? <laughs> I cannot remember that I know what his position is to, to issues of, of defense or, or foreign policy, Syria. I just didn't look, I can't look, but I didn't. So I don't know what he, what he thinks about that or. What he thinks about Trump generally. Yeah, he's what he thinks he about transgender. He has a foreign policy, yes. I mean, he doesn't have no. No, Maybe he, he thinks, I uh, don't need to. Uh, he thinks about New York and England, that's foreign policy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yes, sir. Hi, Bruce Rosen, um, Mr. Visitor. Um, I guess from what you said, the, 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 the concept of the common European home is not there, maybe not even for the EU. Um, so skipping over that, um, didn't bring up the issue in terms of a, a need to discuss even with people, um, actually more than discuss with, with people we have problems with, to put it politely, the climate crisis. The climate crisis is also a freshwater crisis, which goes back to the, the, the two main things both fossil fuels and nuclear power and processing use tremendous amounts of, of fresh water, which are then totally uncoverable. And we don't, we have less and less water than we had before we had speech sheets on um, words. So there must be some way to, to be a conduit. The other thing is the factor of the emergence of huge global multinational firms, which are somewhat sovereign to themselves and, and tell the states what to do, are in places that 20 or 30 years ago, we might not have expected them to emerge, China, India, Brazil, South Africa, but also in some of the at least smaller in terms of population democracies um, like Australia and Canada, particularly in the, the um, natural resources disemboweling corporations. Um, and we seem to have no ability to gain control. They have access to the levers of power. And they obviously have a say in what goes on. They obviously are very good for what goes on in Moscow or Beijing or Tehran, as well as Washington and Paris and London and Berlin. Um, so do you have any thoughts of how we even begin to deal with this and begin to deal with this at a rapid pace that we need to, 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 to approach um, these entities. I was afraid when I started to talk that people would accuse me of being over complex. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> you tell me I'm under complex. And um, mm -hmm. I think, I don't think I was under complex related to the issue of today, but in general, when we talk about the issues in the world and, and what uh, some people now started to call poly crisis, right? That is, that is what you have in mind, I think, right? Not only climate, climate problems, but also inflation, identity issues, IT issues. Uh, if you look at um, what is happening now with, with Twitter, in 24 hours, right? And that has relevance for hundreds of people, hundreds of millions of people, billions, maybe, I don't know, right? So there are many things uh, where we could talk about and think about, but um, I did not want to bring that in as well because I think it was probably already a lot. And number one and number two is my expertise is uh, not very narrow, but I'm not a specialist for climate, for example. Um, and some things, their uh, identity issues. You also could could. Uh, I think my my 
impression is when I travel through the world, which is not as much as it used to be, right? What brings many people together, often they don't know that, mm -hmm. is many mm -hmm. people don't understand what is what the heck is going on in the world, right? And there are no narratives which help them to bring them to understand that in one way or the other. And that should be our task, I guess, at the academia to think how we could sometimes maybe be helpful with producing uh, these kind of narratives. Sometimes I feel like I should be more in that area, but that's very, that's very difficult. But if, as you said, from your own experience with your own colleagues in other countries, doors are shut, not even, obviously not by your intent, nor the intent of the people on the other side, but um, how do we create um, critical new openings? And I, and, and I think that the climate is probably the most important issue because it's basic life and tied into that is water because without fresh water, there is no life. Yeah. Again, I'm, I think basically we are on the same page. I agree that these issues are really demanding more attention. I'm not convinced that I can help be helpful here uh, today. There's one point, maybe we have different opinions, maybe not. I do not assume that all people, no matter where I go and to whom I talk, basically have the same interests or ideas, because I think there are people, also very high level people, who are not interested in addressing that. And there are limits of talks, where talks can be not useful because you don't have a partner who has the same kind of basic interests. Yeah, and that's Russia in the climate talks right now, at least. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, you did. I'm, just, I'm ready for you to finish. Oh, sorry. <laughs> did, did, someone, did I see a hand? Oh, yeah, I yeah. do. I do have a oh, question. Okay. I just didn't yeah. want to cut you off. Oh, no. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, hi, my name is Larissa Shishka. Um, I'm a master's student um, in social psychology here um, at Columbia. I'm also Ukrainian American. Oh. Um, and I was really interested to hear your thoughts because of the title, the unanticipated war. Um, and my, so my grandmother has early stage dementia. She lives with my parents. About this time last year, she started asking my mother, when is he invading? When is he invading? When is he invading? Um, and my mom had to pick a day. And she said, well, it's going to be, it's not going to be during, before Christmas. It's not going to be before New Year's. And then there's the old calendar. So my mom picked the date of February 20th. Wow. My, my, my homemaker mother said, wrote it on my grandmother's calendar that Russia, that Putin will be invading on February 20th. So I was really curious because to whom was this an unanticipated war? Because my community was seeing it coming for nearly half a year. Was it was it the like from a from a German perspective? I, I don't assume it's it's from a German perspective, but from what perspective was it an unanticipated war? Or is the unanticipated war not this invasion in reference to something else? I would ask, I would say that there was a broad, broad consensus between Western politicians mm. that this would not gonna happen. Some of them said, oh, last time I called President Putin and he promised to me that is, he is not going to invade. Oh, right? he promised. Yes. Oh, you mean Macron? He said that. And yeah, uh, many people said that. And um, many people didn't want to believe that. Mm -hmm because the consequences, as we now learned the hard way, are very serious, right? So I can understand that you don't want that, but when you have professionally, as a journalist, as an academician or whatever, this as your field of interest, you should do the very best to come to some conclusions. I know that when you, for nine months, 
have 75,000 soldiers located and deployed somewhere, right? First of all, that is expensive, yeah? But second, imagine one Thursday morning, the Russian president says, oh, guys, good news for you. You can get home to your home deployment areas, right? Because of such and such. You need a really, really damned good explanation after so many months to bring tens of thousands of armed people back home. Why did you do that? People ask you, what, what do we have? What is the gain? What is the why, right? I mean, Mr. Putin is not really dependent on, on election or is dependent on election. He fortifies himself, but he also has to look at, uh, I said that before, at surveys, right? And when his uh, underlings, citizens in Russia say, hey, hey, what? That is not good for him either. So I was absolutely sure that he would use these, uh, these soldiers for invasion. Uh, so we are ready to together with your granny, was it? Or? Yeah, yeah, my, my yeah. grandmother, my mother yeah. in the US. Many people don't want, don't want it to leave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I am not a scholar, but I have read the book and I am not an academic. I'm just old. And I've been observing this thing. I found what you said uh, to be very interesting and also pessimistic. So I would like your opinion. Uh, my feeling is that um, the situation will get worse because um, Iran has a lot of missiles, which it's going to gleefully send to Russia to support Russia, because there's nothing more that they would like than to embarrass the United States or to see the decline of the West. And the same thing goes for North Korea and China. So to my mind, even though the Russian troops may not be effective, those missiles are, and they're creating chaos. And I don't see them stopping. And I see no reason for Putin to think he should stop. Am I, are my opinions so ill-founded? No, I don't think so. <clears throat> the Russian army is in a, or armed forces are in a situation which is not very convenient for them. They are outmaneuvered and chased away from areas which the, the Russians took over, and now they are defeated in the field. That is very, very hard for Russians to swallow for different reasons. In general, because Russia is one of the country societies where I think they have really a very high level of machismo. And then from this, Ukrainians who don't deserve to be around here to start with, right? To have their own state. And they dare and come and chase our soldiers back from here and back from there. That is a major problem for Russia. Yes, so that is why not having other options, not having enough soldiers, let alone enough qualified soldiers with the proper training, right? It's not enough to collect tens of thousands of people who never had a, a weapon in their hands, right? That's not good. They also don't have enough qualified officers who know how to delegate certain things and not. Sometimes the soldiers have to buy from their own money gear to protect themselves, food, because they don't get enough food. It's, it's not a joke. I'm telling you how it is. So that, that is the army, right? And what they then do, right? They raise what they can. Villages, Ukrainian villages, towns, they send artillery, 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 not very much targeted. They just send it over and they don't care at all 
what the result is. That is how it is. That is kind of related that they have the feeling of, uh, well, how dare they, right? And then there is some kind of revenge behavior. And then there are some countries who support them uh, in different ways. I would argue that China in the last couple of weeks is surprisingly careful, including in the public statements they make about Russia. And China was jumping immediately on the uh, famous statement from the Indian Prime Minister Modri, this is no time for war. China repeated that. And also in the United Nations, they had some voting behavior, which was surprising. But Iran then is another regime, which is uh, shaky, let me put it this way, right? Because of domestic uh, events and international events. And uh, they sell very cheap uh, armed drones to Russia. They don't care what the Russians do with that. For the Russians, it is easy because they lose drones, but not people. And the drones do a lot of havoc, a lot of bad things. Mm -hmm. uh, and this Iran thing is, uh, is extremely touchy now for the international community, because on the one hand, Many people still say we have to keep the nuclear agreement or to get it reinstalled because nothing is worse than a mad Iranian leadership with nuclear weapons. Others say that is violation of human rights to such an extent that we cannot be silent. We have to do something in terms of sanctions and public statements and whatever. But when we do that, they are not going to sign the nuclear agreement. So that is the situation many governments feel right now. That is indeed, uh, I, I accept that it is a very difficult situation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, going back to the earlier point, I guess our name is Stanley Labusa, who is a prospective student in the tour. Ah, welcome. Welcome. Students, perspective student, so oh, not perspective. a student yet wow. here, actually. Yeah. yeah, I was just wondering, so looking back, it's sort of like the, the argument of your right for self defense, the decoupling, right, of the ships as a positive step. Uh, but if you take a step back, it is it does look like polarization, right? It does look like a move towards isolation. And in a way, radicalization is sort of like compared with the Democrats and Republicans here in the US that where we can't work across the aisle anymore, you can't talk to each other anymore. And that's sort of happening on a global scale. And then on the other hand though, you could say that the whole trade change thing, <laughs> the one with the other, um, actually worked for 30 years, right? Because for 30 years, we had peaceful relationships with Russia, with China, right? There's definitely, if you look at Russia and China 30 years ago, they were in a very, much worse state than they are today in terms of civil rights as well. So there has been some improvements and there has been peace for 30 years. Um, and China continuing with trading on a large scale globally, very aggressively, but just not with the US and Europe, <laughs> but with Africa, with the Middle East, even Australia is much more you know, strongly tied down to China. So possibly, I think the trading relationship is actually a positive step, but maybe needs to be rethought or strategically, you know, organized differently. Possibly. Uh, I, I disagree here. <clears throat> Australia and China have very, very touchy relations because the Australians made many experience with their economic pressure from, from China. Many more countries now have started to think about, is it a good policy to uh, be dependent to more than 50% for new cars to be produced in Western countries? Is it a good idea to be dependent on chips from China or chips from Taiwan, which can be easily blocked by China? 
uh, or I think that is not not a very ideal situation. And what China understands under trade and what Western countries understand under economic relations is not obviously not the same. Uh, I would be ready to discuss what you said when the conditions would be equal, but they are not. China obliges any Western company to allow that a cell from a communist party can be established in this company. Hello? Imagine Germany would oblige other countries to accept cells from the conservative party or the social Democrats and, and the company or something. Then investment from China is not much limited so, so far at Shenzhen right now in many Western countries. When you go to China and want to participate in a local or regional audit, to make an investment not possible. So, so reciprocity is the core word here, right? When reciprocity is not guaranteed, then the whole thing is not, I think, worth uh, following, following. That it worked, no. There was, if there was peace, we can debate, but it was not a very warm relationship and definitely did neither China nor the Soviet Union nor the post-Soviet Russia move towards independent law spheres, for example, right, or whatever. Uh, it was coexistence. It was not, I would say, a peaceful and constructive development towards some rules, for example, that there is a separate uh, uh, law system. There is not some fancy democracy idea. That is also something many managers say. We need that when we make investment. We need an independent law, a legal system, right? And not someone where the governor or whoever can call and say, well, this and that should be your decision. Therefore, I'm a little bit more, more skeptical. There's one, one <laughs> difference I would agree. The Soviet Politburo was more rule-bound and more reliable than the Russian leadership ever was mm -hmm. after Yeltsin. Mm -hmm. Can you just follow up on that one of the comments? I think dependence is not a good concept. Interdependence is a better concept and a better approach. Along with that, in the regards to what she said, and I've written marginally on this, not direct completely, is Bundle do shundle is a good concept if you also say what the net result should be. We don't do it unless you have this code of law. We don't do it unless you do that. In other words, it was never it was never conditioned. It was just trade. And investments, we are both all up to investment treaties, they're bullshit. They don't have real teeth. So it's time, like Macron was wanting to do with Brazil, stop with the Amazon and we'll talk about trade. It's time to condition trade agreements, condition investment agreements with teeth. And that's where I think we failed. This is German, rather than political strategy. And, it, uh, and I'll just say also one thing, I mean, China has been, I mean, this is all true and accurate, but at the same time, China has been reluctant to challenge the US sanctions re regime because it's a little bit you know, uh, more closely tied to what needs the US more than it needs Russia. So this kind of like the degree of, of the economic ties really matters for China's decision about whether it's going to challenge the US sanction regime and be that kind of ally. I mean, it's not missing, uh, China's not sending missiles to Russia and I don't think it will. I don't think, it, I don't think that that's an offer for China. Did you have another? Yeah. yeah. Um, earlier, there was uh, at the Columbia Business School, there was a guy from the uh, Japanese government and he was talking exactly the same thing changing the supply chain. And they're trying to produce their own chips and stuff. It was very, very interesting. Why is Putin so popular in Russia? I don't understand <laughs> that. He is a thief. He's a killer, but the people who love him, I don't understand that. What, what is that? <laughs> what is the source <laughs> of that? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't no, mean, no, but like, what's the, I don't think the people. Right? Well, I mean, they, well, he has a high approval rate. Without a war, he has 
lower uh, rates of trust, but with the war, yes, even higher. But even without a war, it is in the area of something around 60%. Yeah, 60% approval rate, that's yeah. Yeah. And the question, the, the question, the question is is uh, is a good one. Yeah. One, there are probably a couple of ideas. One idea is the Russian president is a person who made it possible for himself mm -hmm. to make in two different system career, mm -hmm. Soviet system and the post-Soviet mm -hmm. system without distancing distancing himself from either. Mm -hmm. Understand what I mean? The collapse of the Soviet mm -hmm. Union was not for everybody the biggest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, as someone said, mm -hmm. but for many people, ordinary people in the post-Soviet Union, it was very difficult mm -hmm. because before they could, there were no borders, right? There were 16 union republics in this former Soviet Union. Later, there were state borders. And you had to have these fancy concepts like maybe visa or passports or whatever agreements to visit parts of your family. And it was also difficult, admittedly, I lived in the country a while, a couple of years. <laughs> there are, that in many families, the question, who are you, where you're from, how do you define yourself, was, was a very fancy question because the mother had been uh, from Tatarstan, the father was Jewish, and then the, the great, great, uh, uh, what do I mean? Uh, yeah, the next ethnic intermixing, more, there's more, a lot of multicultural. More, you know, so the next generation yeah, was even, Gernspans, exactly, thank you, was even more difficult. So, and that is why many people said without any political or idea, uh, I'm a Soviet person, right? Mm -hmm. Because that was easier, that covered everything, right? And today you have to, oh my God, am I Ukraine am I this or that and whatever, and so and so many percentages of this and that. So all that became much more identity issues in general, it became much more difficult after the collapse of the USSR, which still I would argue for different reasons, uh, was a reasonable thing because they didn't manage the economy most of all, but also culture and many other things. So therefore he symbolizes, right? He does not distance himself from the Soviet, does not distance himself from the current situation. He's also what people like sometimes, a guy who can be nasty to other guys, right? Also to Western people and the Russians who may have sometimes a complex that they are of less value or less relevant or whatever. And when they see that they are number one, has a certain habit of acting with other people, they like that in a way, right? Brought in a dog? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They like that as well. Uh -huh. It's like a meat Russia it, again. Yes, yeah. it's, it's machismo Russian mm -hmm. style. So. But it's not just automatic. I mean, the government has, for many, many years, put out certain messages to try to, you know, populate people's mind and train them to think a certain yeah. way. And one of the big messages for many years was, look how bad your life was after the Soviet Union collapsed in the 90s, and you were all poor, and now, you know, Putin came to power, and now you all have money and a middle-class lifestyle. So it's not just magic. Like, they worked very hard, the, the Kremlin, it's on very putting well out well these messages. Yeah, yeah. Very and very they're, well they're, 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 uh, they're more sophisticated than in the Soviet time. So there can be many reasons or many kinds of, uh, for different people, why they, mm -hmm. and then of course, destroying political comp competition and the media is part mm -hmm. of the story. And keep in mind what Tennyson's book did, Tennyson Jeffries, who is a graduate here, she wrote a book on Stalin, how the millennials do Stalin. Very simple, he put us on the map, they like it. <laughs> But, but independent of the sophistication of the control and manipulation options mm -hmm. of the media, most people in Russia have one source of information, yeah. mm -hmm. and this is TV. In smaller towns, in villages, whatever, sometimes we have no bandwidth for internet, and the only thing where older people can get anything, including strange series and whatever, is TV, right? 
So that is everything. And the tree is 100% in straight hands. So we can imagine what is going to happen there. And those people who are fluent in internet and whatever, this kind of stuff, in the hundreds of thousands, they are gone. So, so what is the information level of those who are remaining? Thank you. Um, okay, so maybe this should be the last question since we've been at this for a while. Yes. I'm wondering, the um, collapse of the Soviet Union um, also had involved in it Western advisors who somehow were the only people on the planet that did not know about the vertical institution uh, uh, integration of Soviet institutions. You know, the, the factory that you work for, on um, housing, on um, the vacation places, provided the health care and, and all of that. So there was a complete breaking apart. The other thing was the demographic shifts post the vision of people crossing borders also included, particularly in the Russian Federation, um, the hyper concentration of the population in the cities. Moscow emerged still on the European peninsula as the largest metropolitan area on the peninsula. Um, I think Petersburg was two as it was for a long time. And then there's a game of who's number three every year. Yeah. Um, and that has had a profound effect because then you're having this tremendous depopulation um, in, in between. So you have these isolated areas. And I'm wondering what kind of of that. Yeah. That so uh, we could discuss, but not today, <laughs> the role of Western advisors in the 1990s, mm -hmm. but not for the collapse of the USSR. Yeah. That are two very different issues. But once you raise that, I exploit your question and say something, what I forgot to say in my introduction, but what I find is of crucial importance. There's something joined between Soviet Union and Russia, more than one thing, but one thing which is core. And that is the exclusive and dominant position of the extractive sector. Energy is unbelievably important for the economic, for the economy of the Soviet Union and the Russian Federation, and for politics in the Soviet Union and the Russian Federation. Because what we have here is a great example of a petrostate in action. We have a whole debate in social science about the role of petrostates, that are states who are basically making a living for the society and the politicians and pretty much everyone, because accidentally they have oil and gas in the earth, right? Then you don't have to do anything. When you have that, you are like, yeah, you made it. So there's no much intelligence uh, required for that. And these petrostates, basically make a living, not by being ingenious and inventing things, right? Being good in IT development and whatever. The only thing where they have to be good is, is to manage the distribution of energy rents. The income from selling this oil and gas, what accidentally is in the earth, is a rent because they don't really earn that. They have it accidentally. So, and then they have to distribute this rent and as long as the formula for the Russian economy will not be changed away from this rent distribution, it does not matter if it is Ivanov or Petrov or whatever the name of the guy is who is running the whole thing. The political thing will be the same. So that is why it is of crucial relevance that we think about that that was one of the reasons why it was so important to stop from the European side the, the, the energy kind of deliveries. But now we have uh, India and, and China, who else, who don't have an issue with it. So when we do not manage to stop this 
rent distribution think then who said that i'm really very pessimistic i yes but when we manage to kind of change that then i would turn myself into a more optimistic mood mm -hmm. thank you very okay, much for yeah thank you great conversation thank you so much There was nothing in terms of um, so health or yes, there was um, the agent that they predict the day of the Okay, I'm going to get to work on this. Thank you.